I landed a new job a few weeks ago as the director of a psychiatric facility. My patients are mostly okay, but my co-workers are freaking me out. I interviewed with this gentleman from the state, the director of the state's Department of Health and Welfare. While he was kind, he was also very blunt. He informed me that no one was willing to take the job, so by default he was giving it to me. The only willing applicant who met the minimum educational requirements. For anyone else, this candor would have been a gut punch, but for me it was a godsend. No one seemed to want to hire me and suddenly I had an offer. I happily accepted, a decision I've come to regret. Today was my first day. I walked through the security screening and the guards made me hand over my cell phone. When I moved to question the reasoning, the guards simply pointed at a sign that read, This is a closed facility. There are no cell phones nor other outside communication devices allowed within the building. As I walked into the hospital, I was greeted by the janitor, a middle-aged man who seemed to be in the early stages of Parkinson's. Tremors visibly afflicted his hands. I wish I could say the man welcomed me warmly, but he looked at me like I was nothing more than an annoyance. I'll show you to your office, he grunted out frustratingly. I followed him down this long corridor, all the while the many keys clipped to his belt loop chimed through the halls, garnering the attention of everyone we passed. The patients minded their own business for the most part, but the staff all gave me the meanest of scowls. If I didn't know better, it seemed like they hated me already. The stroll to my new office gave me a chance to get a feel for the place, and sad to say I was not impressed. The facility was in shambles, it was run down and unsanitary. Rats feasted in any and all open trash cans. The patients looked as if they haven't been bathed in days, and some even took the liberty to defecate freely in the halls. As you can imagine, the smell was horrific. But the most horrific aspect of the building was that I couldn't shake the feeling that everyone was watching me. One man in particular caught my eye, an older gentleman, who wore a tattered hospital gown. The only patient who seemed to share the same arbitrary hatred towards me. We reached a door that still bore the name of my predecessor, Dr. Richardson. Fidgeting with his keys, the janitor plucked one and inserted it into the doorknob, swinging the door wide open and promptly turning around to leave. I tried showing my gratitude, but he simply returned a, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sound from his keys grew fainter as he traveled farther down the hall. The perimeter of my office was surrounded by file cabinets, and an old outdated computer and a landline phone sat on the mostly empty desk. In the center of the flat top sat a lone piece of paper. The paper's header read, Must Read, Important Information Regarding Several of the Patients at the Facility. Dr. Richardson left me some guidance. This was a kind gesture and I was grateful for the last psychologist's foresight. No one likes to be dropped into the deep end. The note started off by detailing basic facility rules. Then it conveyed several tidbits about notable patients, though the note did not say anything about the relevant files being heavily redacted, as I'd soon come to find. Patient 106 suffers from extreme schizophrenia. Do not assume she can be transferred to a less vigilant wing of the facility solely because she appears to be improving. She is crafty and will take advantage of any breathing room you give her. She will harm herself and others if given a chance. I couldn't help but pull this patient's file as I read this passage. Inside should have been a complete medical history of the patient in question. But besides a brief physical description, age 42, gender female, height 5 feet 1 inch, black hair, the rest of the documentation was made unreadable by streaking black ink. However, what wasn't redacted confirmed the information given by my predecessor's note. 
Patient 143 is in a near constant state of catatosis, with emphasis on the near. He will briefly snap out of his trance if you give him your back. Do not let him sneak up behind you. In his file it read, Age 28, gender male, height 5 feet 10 inches, bald. The patient suffers from a near state of catatosis with brief bouts of extreme violent episodes. The rest of the file was redacted in the same black ink as the last. The patient list was long, but as I neared the end, another large, bold heading caught my attention. Do not skip. Information on patient 151. The section was written completely in bold letters, ensuring that the instructions popped against the white paper. This patient is the most dangerous in our facility. You will find out more about him in his file, but to ensure the safety of yourself and everyone else, you must follow these rules. Avoid looking at patient 151, he doesn't like it. Do not acknowledge his presence when he creeps around you. Do not say his identification number out loud. Do not mention Dr. Richardson's name, my name around him. Follow these rules to the letter and 151 will not make your life difficult. As you can see from the heavy security, this facility operates cautiously. The information within this note is for you and you alone. Do not share it with anyone. I wish you the best of luck with your new position. Best regards, Dr. Richardson. I leaned back against my chair, digesting the information the doctor had given me before the need to pull 151's file overtook me. The manila folder was buried at the far end of a file cabinet. When I opened it, surprise, surprise, heavily redacted. Name, black ink redaction. Age 71. Height 5 feet 3 inches. Hair gray. 151 has a history of strong delirium, along with countless other conditions that amplify his delusions. This patient has an extremely violent history and has admitted to a long list of crimes. The patient is self-admitted, but there is doubt that he will ever leave the care of the state. Authorities have been made aware of his confessions as state law demands. His condition continues to worsen, but for now we can only await a court order for his transfer to a better equipped mental hospital. Note: No matter what we try, the patient manages to escape confinement. Follow the rules regarding this patient and no incidences should occur. In the back of the file was the only image included with any of the documentation. A simple black and white picture of an old man. His face was wrinkled, his skin drooping off of his bones, and his eyes had an aura of sadness to them. It felt almost hypnotic to gaze into his gray eyes, like they were trying to tell me something, drawing me closer the longer I stared. Suddenly, I heard the pitter-patter of bare feet on laminate flooring. In the doorway crested a man's gray mane. It was the patient who had been watching me from the second I first walked into the facility. It was as if the man knew I was thinking about him. I looked down at the picture in my hand and back up at the man, finding that the two were the same person, though not exactly identical. The eyes of the man before me did not radiate sadness like the ones in picture. They gave off curiosity. Not to mention that it seemed like his orbs had grown since the last time the photo was taken, doubling in size. They now struggled to fit in his eye sockets. They bulged and slanted slightly. His mouth had also changed. Its edges had migrated outwards and now finished in the middle of his cheeks. The man's lips began to part and he showed me his wide, toothless smile. In all my life I had never seen a face as distinct as his. I must have stared a second too long because his brows furled, and he produced an ear-piercing screech from the depths of his chest. It was so high-pitched that my ears yawned. I instantly remembered the instructions in the note. Avoid looking at patient 151, he doesn't like it. Do not acknowledge his presence when he creeps around you. I instantly averted my eyes looking at the blank wall. But it was too late. 
The man wasn't pleased. He started taking a few awkward dragging steps towards my desk until his thighs brushed up against the hard mahogany of my flat top. With one swift motion, he propelled himself off of the ground, feet landing on the desk in front of me. He perched himself in a very animal-like position, sitting on his calves and arms between his legs. He inched his face toward mine. I felt my heart race and a lump began to form in my throat. I was glued to my chair in fear. His mouth opened, tongue slithered out, oozing in secretions. But just as it was about to slide across the side of my face, the sound of steps against the floor billowed into my office. 151 instantly darted out of the room. When he'd rounded the door frame, another figure appeared on the other side. The situation with 151 had made me very uneasy and I couldn't help but jolt as the woman came into view. She was a nurse, her embroidered scrubs reading, Jenny. As the woman suddenly entered the room, she apologized. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Clarence, I didn't mean to scare you, she said. Just then I remembered my predecessor's guidance. This note is for your eyes and your eyes only. I hid both the file and the note under my arms. Jenny was obviously privy to this information because she averted her gaze, preferring to look at the ceiling. Yes, Nurse Jenny, what can I do for you? She fidgeted with her legs, crossing one over the other, like a little girl who'd walked in on her dad's conference call. Um, well, I thought that I would give you a tour of the facility, just so you could get your bearings, you know, Jenny said. She looked strangely nervous. I looked at her and back at the papers under my arms, mulling over her offer. Seems like a great idea, thank you very much, Nurse Jenny. I slid the papers into my desk drawer and followed her out. The tour Jenny took me on did not change my initial impressions of the facility. It was a rotting hellhole. I had half a mind to call the state to get this place shut down, but if I did that, I'd be out of a job. We walked into a common area where most of the patients interacted outside of sleeping hours. Instantly, the hustle and bustle of the room stopped. It was as if my presence had sucked the air out of the common area. The silence was cut by the rhythmic banging of something hard thudding against the brick wall. I seemed to be the only one to acknowledge the sound. When my gaze investigated, I saw a man, the same man who had hopped on my desk, banging his head against the wall. Thud, thud, thud. The wall audibly strained under the stress of his banging, and several cracks now branch off of the impact point. The man suddenly stopped, his back tensing hard. Like a soldier, 151 made a left-facing pivot, feet pointing in my direction. Blood streamed from a gash on his forehead. I shot my gaze to the floor and in an instant, the hustle and bustle of the room roared back to life. Right this way, doctor. Nurse Jenny pointed down a long hallway. The sign overhead read, Wing 3, PICU Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit. Posted at the wing's entrance in this little glass room was a lone security guard dressed in his uniform which included a baseball cap. He was on the younger side, but the furrowed brow he bore signaled he'd seen some things. His sights were firmly planted on the CCTV screens in front of him. This is Clevis, Jenny introduced. He's not much of a talker, but when it comes to being a great security guard, you can always count on him. I looked over at the guard who didn't even acknowledge our presence, but Jenny continued. For this wing, you will need to press this button here to gain access. She reached into Clevis's office and pressed a little button on his table. As Jenny clicked the button, the doors swung open, revealing a long corridor with metal doors on either side of the hallway. The corridor was darker than the rest of the facility, only the emergency lights dimly illuminated the passage. I eyed the long passageway dreading the monsters behind every door. 
but as my dress shoes clinked against the hard laminate flooring, the monster stayed put. I couldn't help but turn to a few of the little tempered windows. To my surprise, most of the rooms were empty. We reached a door on the left side of the corridor. Nurse Jenny pointed over to the sign next to the frame. It read, 106. This is 106. I assume you've already looked over her file. Jenny asked, waiting for an answer. Not much of a file to look at, I thought to myself, but nodded, confirming her inference. Good. She gleamed with a hint of relief. Curiosity got the better of me and I couldn't help peering into 106's room. Inside was a woman in a straitjacket, sitting alone on the floor of the padded room. Her eyes drifted toward the little window, and her file description came back into mind. Age 42, 5 feet 1 inch, black hair. Her face was youthful for a 42-year-old. If I hadn't known better, I'd say she was in her late 20s to early 30s. Her hair was dark, but not as dark as the file's description suggested. It looked more like a darker shade of brown if you asked me. She seemed taller than her file said, but I couldn't be sure in her seated position. Her face looked dazed, drugged even. Mental facilities usually pump their patients full of sedatives. I smiled warmly at 106, signaling my quiet introduction. I could tell 106 wanted to say something, but as she opened her mouth, only a stream of slobber trailed down her face. It's almost time for her next dose of med. I'll be sure to give it to her as soon as we're done with our little tour. Jenny was spectated over my shoulder on her tiptoes. Come on, doctor, right this way. I followed closely behind her. The next door with a sign came into view. 143. This is 143. He is nothing to worry about as long as... She trailed off into a daydream looking at the ceiling. Well, I'm sure his file says it all. Don't turn your back to him. The line written in Richardson's note came back to mind. Stepping up to the tempered glass, I saw the figure of the catatonic patient described by Dr. Richardson. His mouth was ajar, eyes permanently fixed on the wall. But like one of six, the description of the patient did not fully match. 143 was not as hairless as the file suggested. Instead, he touted a short buzz cut. I could tell Jenny noted my mild confusion, and as if she knew exactly what I was thinking, she clarified. Oh, we shave 143's head regularly. We had an incident involving his hair a few months ago. We thought it's safer just to cut it all off. She looked back up at the ceiling. After I'd seen her do this a few times, I gathered her fascination with the roof tiles was some kind of a nervous tech. I'd seen many of my former patients perform this behavior, but usually when they were lying. There was something she wasn't telling me. Well, that's the facility. If you have any questions about the place, be sure to let me know. Jenny clapped her hands in conclusion, abruptly changing the topic. Just then, a familiar sound of bare feet met my ear. It was only the second time I'd heard this sound, and I already knew who the steps belonged to. I saw Jenny's eyes widen as a figure entered the corner of my gaze. My heart was now in my throat as the smacking of feet inched closer. There was something about 151's face that brought about a very primal fear. My breath became uneasy. To my relief, 151 paid us no mind. He just strolled right past us and down the long corridor. When I was sure his back was to me, I turned in his direction. Almost as if he'd seen me, his face instantly pivoted my way. I quickly returned my gaze to the nurse in front of me. Jenny noticed my interaction and itched her arm in her uneasiness. As I turned to look at her jittery gesture, she cowered slightly, her eye giving me a high-stress twitch. I had so many questions about 151, 
but after my abrupt introduction to the psychiatric patient, I never wanted to speak his name again. Another question festered against my tongue. I blurted it out in my anxiety-filled state. Nurse Jenny. Her eyes darted to my lips almost saying, don't you say a word. How many people work here? I questioned. The whole tour I had only seen a few other workers, Jenny and the shy security guard included. Her face washed over with relief before answering my question. So you notice that we're understaffed, huh? About seven. We've been working overtime to keep up with all of the patient care. Her eyes again turned to the ceiling. A few workers for dozens of patients seemed more than understaffed in my opinion. From the shit and rats decorating the halls, I'd say the place was in the midst of a crisis. Well, Nurse Jenny, we're going to have to do some rigorous hiring in the next few weeks. Jenny looked at me and gave a slightly uncomfortable smile. Yes, Doctor, I think that would be a great idea. Her gaze turned back to the roof, suspicion rearing its head once again. We made our way back down the hallway and I couldn't help but look over my shoulder. 151 had disappeared. As we reached the beginning of the wing, Jenny reached back into the security office and a very cold chill washed across my body. Like the unsettling feeling you get when walking up a set of dark stairs at night, thinking someone or something is following. Thanks, Clevis. Jenny said to the security guard, who didn't return the sentiment. Well, I better get back to work. A lot of patients to tend to and only one of me. Jenny said with a quick glance upward. I nodded as I tried to make sense of how odd everyone seemed to be acting. Of course, I responded, giving Nurse Jenny a tilt of the head that signaled my appreciation. She disappeared off into the quiet facility. Meanwhile, Clevis stared at me in silence. Clevis's stare was peering into my soul. His gaze was glassed over, but his mouth gave off a contradicting expression. A very hungry grin inched across his demeanor, and his mouth visibly salivated. I couldn't break my connection with his, but my eyes seemed to have dissuaded his stare because his eyes slowly turned back to the security monitors. Creeped out by the ordeal, I briskly walked back to my office. But as I rounded the corner, I couldn't help but look back one last time at Clevis. His eyes were running me down, like a predator ready to pounce on his next kill. I locked myself in my office. There was something really strange happening at this facility, not just with 151, but with the rest of the staff, Jenny included. I ran back over to my desk, thrusting the drawer open, expecting to find 151's file where I left it. But as the drawer clinked against the wooden stopper, my heart fluttered. The drawer was empty. There was no file. There was no note. I rummaged through every file cabinet, frantically searching for the documentation on 151. When I didn't find it, I slumped back in my chair in defeat. The first day on the job and I had already misplaced documentation. My hands draped over my eyes trying to rub the confusion from my mind. But just as my nerves began to quell, a strange sound came from the door. Bang, bang, bang. I lifted my head turning to the door. The sound rang out again. Bang, bang, bang. It sounded like someone was knocking on the wall next to my door. The memory of 151 banging his head on the common room wall flooded back. I raised myself off of the chair trying to be as quiet as I could. But the chair gave a loud, yeah. Hello, is anyone there? I called out but no one answered. I gripped the door handle taking in a deep breath before peering out at the culprit. But as the hinges squeaked and my eyes cautiously looked out into the dimly lit hallway, nothing was there. Instead, the harmonic chime of keys echoed through the hall, followed by the sloshing of water and the scraping of wood on the hard laminate floor. I turned to the end of the long hallway to see the janitor, mopping the floor in a very strange fashion. 
The head of the mop was up in the air, and he rhythmically painted the floor with the end of the mop's handle. All the while, the keys on his belt loop continued to ring. He was perfectly situated under one of the many pothole lights that decorated the passage. I gripped the edge of the door frame. As a psychologist, I'm trained to see a psychotic break when I see one. The janitor seemed to be having one before my very eyes. Just as I was about to call out, Nurse Jenny stepped out of an intersecting hallway. She cautiously walked up to the janitor, whispering something in his ear. They both froze under the light before simultaneously swiveling their heads towards me. The warm gaze that Jenny had welcomed me with had disappeared. It was now replaced by an icy look of hatred and disgust. The janitor mirrored her expression. The man dropped the mop and they both quickly walked into the dark intersecting hallway. An exaggerated buzzing from one of the many pothole lights in the opposite direction caught my attention. Standing under one of the corridor's spotlights was Patient 151. He was staring into the shine of the bulb. His eyes were fixated on the humming fluorescent fixture, and his neck craned in an unnatural position. I wanted to open my mouth, but I couldn't find the words to disturb his trance. His arms cranked to the back of his posture, elbows snapping at the bend and flexing past a normal range of human ability. His mouth gaped wide open and the cracking of unwilling joints filled the air as he fought not to let his jaw unhinge. Despite his best efforts, his jaw dislocated. It now hung disgustingly by the ligaments of his face. The jagged fingers on his hands became more gnarled as they snapped at every joint. With every crackle and pop, Patient 151 gave an audible gasp of pain. The light fixture began to waver, and Patient 151's body started seizing. The bulb started to flicker. The bulb buzzed more violently until finally it cracked, raining down shards of glass all over the sickly man. Sequentially, the rest of the bulbs down the corridor began to burst, showering me in specks of light and smog as the bulb's innards plumed out into the air. The hall was pitch black. All was quiet and nothing stirred. Only my unsteady breathing was heard as I quivered out every lungful. The smoke from the exploding bulb set off the fire alarms, which now blared wildly as their little strobe lights rhythmically joined their howls. In the flashing lights, I saw patient 151 standing in the same position I'd last seen. He was a statue. Suddenly his left hand gave the slightest of twitches. In an instant, the fingers on his hand had caved into his palm and palm into his forearm. Soon his full arm had retracted into his torso. His shoulder joint was in a visible pucker. The sight made my skin crawl, but soon the bile from my gut started to burn the back of my throat as the man's arm visibly floundered inside his chest. The hand inched its way up past 151's collarbone into his neck and out his esophagus. As the hand began to exit his mouth, it pried apart his dislocated jaw, stretching his face open like some human Pac-Man. The man's body began to morph as the hand continued wriggling its way out of his face. I noticed a head began to peer through the large opening. I likened the sight to a snake shedding its skin. Only this man was not shedding. He was turning his body inside out like some reversible sweater. Soon the man's body was in a full inversion. The inner linings of his body now glistened under the strobing lights. In my shock, I quivered out and unthinking, My God! 151's disgusting face violently shifted in my direction. Again, I had unwillingly violated one of the rules on Dr. Richardson's note. Don't acknowledge 151. He took to a full sprint and I retreated back into my office, slamming the door shut. I now spectated through the little window of my office door, expecting 151 to rear his ugly head. Seconds turned into minutes, and the head never crested over the window's edge. 
I inched closer to the glass, expecting him to lunge. But as the strobe lights continued to eliminate the corridor, I could see that patient 151 had disappeared. This isn't happening, this isn't happening, this isn't happening. The voice in my head frantically and repeatedly stated, I needed answers to everything I'd just seen. Running to the computer, I pulled up the patient roster and searched for patient 151, but only an error message returned. Patient 151 does not exist. What the hell? I whispered through my shaky lip. The image of Jenny came back to mind, so I quickly pulled up the hospital employee records, typing Jenny into the search bar. When the records pixelated in front of me, my face filled with a warm wash of panic-stricken blood. In Nurse Jenny's file, there was an employee photo, but it wasn't the Nurse Jenny that had greeted me. It was the face of Patient 106, the woman I had seen in the padded room wearing the straitjacket. I darted to Patient 106's file and held the documentation up to the light. The black ink had not masked all of the redacted portions of the documentation. Under the shine of the bright lights, I could see the distinct outline of lettering. My eyes swayed as I read the redacted portions on 106. 106 is highly manipulative and extremely intelligent. She tends to bend the truth to the point where she almost believes her own lies. 106 has a tell whenever she's being untruthful. Her eyes will always look at the ceiling. My mind returned to the way Nurse Jenny, or this imposter Jenny, would look at the ceiling whenever she was nervous. Instantly, Clevis, the security guard, came to mind. When his staff profile graced my screen, I saw an image of patient 143, the one in a constant state of catatosis. Only in his work ID image does he have a full head of hair. It was not shaven. My mind darted to the cap the security guard wore. Clevis must be bald under there. Do not turn your back to him. The word in Dr. Richardson's note came back into mind. The image of Clevis's expression changing every time I gave him my back screamed in my mind. The image of the janitor replayed in my head and the visible tremors that afflicted his hands now resembled medication withdrawals rather than the shake of a Parkinson's patient. Then it hit me. While Nurse Jenny was giving me the tour of the facility, the janitor must have come into my room and rummaged through my things, taking the note in 151's file with him. Sure enough, when I pulled up the page on the janitorial staff, the man mopping the floor earlier was nowhere to be found. I wanted to pound my head against the desk as I came to terms with the fact that the patients had taken over the facility and I was trapped in a building full of freed psychopaths. I turned to my office's landline wanting to call for help, but as I raised it to my ear the line was cut. I grunted in frustration. I need to get help. I need to get the real hospital staff out of the building. My mind wandered to the woman in 106's room and the trail of slobber that trailed down her chin. Nurse Jenny's words replaying in my head. It's almost time for her next dose. This imposter Nurse Jenny was drugging the staff, making sure they were so stoned that they couldn't say a word. This imposter was no nurse. And if I can't get back to hospital wing three, she could give the real nurse Jenny a lethal dose of psychiatric medications. The man passing as 143 might already be beyond the point of no return. I need to get to wing three, but patient 151 is lurking somewhere just outside my door. I've tried signaling for help through my computer, but no one is returning my damn emails. Screw this closed facility. So now I take to the internet chat forums, hoping someone knows what the hell is happening with patient 151. His affliction is obviously beyond my area of expertise. His condition seems demonic to me. Please, 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 scour the internet for any information regarding 151's affliction. 
send it to me before it's too late. I have to get to patience in wing three and if nobody can provide me with information, I'm just going to have to make a run for it. There is no telling what Jenny is planning. I keep replaying the information I'd seen on the non-existent 151, and a line makes me very uneasy. No matter what we try, the patient manages to escape confinement. It seems like my office door will not hold 151 back for long. Please help me, I don't want to die.